Sarsitya, who will speak on uh, on the algebras which are inductive limits of Banach spaces. Okay, so thank you. I wish to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to give this talk. So the title of the talk, as you mentioned, is uh, Algebras which are inductive limits of Banach spaces. And, uh, sorry. Yeah, and the aim of the talk is really to present a relatively new class of topological algebras called strong algebras and some of their applications. Uh, the motivation comes not really from, real, from complex analysis, but from uh, Idazoic no space theory and Kulatriev space of stochastic distributions. But as we will see, the focus space is in the background and also power series and infinite number of variables too. So that really function theory will appear and is not so far away. I will give, a, I, I'm not sure I will give applications. I will at least mention links with linear system theory. And by this, I mean signal theory and control theory, rational analytic functions. I'm not sure I will discuss too much, but I will mention the links. I will not discuss applications in non commutative probability theory, uh, like free analysis, uh, hyper complex analysis, but there are a lot also uh, links and applications. So, uh, one moment, sorry. So, really, the talk is at the intersection of a number of topics like complex analysis, hyper complex analysis, like in the quaternic setting, and stochastic and infinite dimensional analysis, I, uh, like we'll. Uh, with this uh, kernel here. And the links between these will be really by positive definite functions and the associated reporting kernel dot spaces and the strong algebras, which I will, uh, which I will define. Here I mentioned some for references. There are more, but the only reason I mentioned these, uh, I would like to mention some of my students. So here, Ariel Pinchas was my student at Ben Gurion University that was related to his uh, Master thesis and Guy Solomon also for his master thesis at uh, at uh, Ben Gurion and Ismail Paiva Chapman he was my uh, graduate my PhD student and there are more references we can see you can see on my homepage or on archive or you can ask me so the the outline of the talk is uh, will be really in these parts uh, I would like first to discuss a bit. Uh, linear systems and analytic functions and the branch of next spaces, it will be very short, but it's in some sense to give some motivation to, to, the, to the whole work. Then I will give another motivating example, which involves the temporal distributions and we'll get a first example of a strong algebra. Then we'll make a detour via countably norm spaces and the first formal definition. I will not, in this talk, I will not give a most general definition but uh, uh, there are various uh, definitions with various uh, level of generalities, but I will give you a first uh, definition. Then I will give some more examples. And uh, in particular, the Wiener algebra associated to a strong algebra. And this is an important example because I will start with the inductive limit of Hilbert spaces. And then we'll see that even if you start with Hilbert spaces, the Wiener algebra shows you that you can get also naturally an algebra of a kind I want to discuss, which is an inductive limit of Banach spaces. And then uh, on an example only, uh, but you can see more on some of the papers, we will replace uh, the pair Z and N, if you want the integers and the naturals, by a locally compact group and a Borel semi-group, and we'll have some applications to Dirichlet series. And toward the end, we'll go um, a, li a little via infinite dimensional analysis, and then we'll go back to function theory. So this is the outline of a lecture and um, so to begin, sorry, yeah. Just one more remark before I begin. So what is in common in all these examples is that in some, you, have given, you are given a Banach space with a natural product, but the product is not a law of composition in the space and you would like to make it a law of composition how to enlarge the space. Well, uh, for instance, if you look at L to N, the uh, square summable uh, sequences, well, it's not closed under the convolution. But can we embed L to N inside an algebra where the convolution would be a law of composition and a bit more? The whole point also here is and a bit more, which I will make more precise in the, in the sequel. And the approach here, which was motivated by stochastic processes, is to enlarge 
the space to an inductive limit of one X spaces where the product is defined. And as a nice property, I will make this also more precise. So this is, this is a, a, a nice example. If you want to have the L2, it's not closed under convolution. You want to see what, what, what we can do. So um, some, some background on uh, the linear system theory, a very short, I mean, very, basically there are one, one slide or one slide and a half. Uh, it's a huge domain. So what I'm saying is very, uh, very, very uh, simplified. And uh, uh, just to give the definition it, it, in some sense. So if you have a linear time invariant system, time invariant doesn't mean it doesn't depend on time, of course, but it is invariant under shift. Then um, you have here, the, you have such a re relation which links the input sequence. Uh, you will use zero. It could be two-sided. I wrote it on purpose one-sided. The output sequence and S0, S1 is the impulse response. And so provided it converge, there is no reason why this power series S of Z would converge at all. But this is a transfer function. And if there is convergence, at least in the neighborhood of the origin, then you have this very simple connection. And as we teach our students in complex variable, that multiplication of power series correspond to uh, a convolution. Now, of course, properties, the important point here, the links with function theory, is that properties of S of this transfer function, if it exists, are related to the properties of a system. For instance, uh, if there, uh, there is more than one way to define dissipativity of a system, but if we define dissipativity by the L2 norm, uh, no, if we define the energy by the L2 norm, excuse me, then the system would be called dissipative if the out, for, for every input you n, then the energy of the output would be less than the energy of the input. So, um, and that makes a link with, uh, that makes a link with our uh, uh, old friends here is that uh, there is this theorem, uh, a time invariant because a linear system would be dissipative if and only if its transfer function is analytic and contractive in the open unit disk, or equivalently, if and only the kernel, this kernel is positive definite in the open unit disk, a sure function, or function analytic and contractive uh, in the open unit disk. Uh, I will I will define, apologies for this, I don't know what, uh, I, so I will recall later in the, in the lecture what is what means positive definite function, but meanwhile, let's just say we have it all in, uh, in, 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 in mind. Um, so I would like to mention also that so uh, associated to such a, uh, the following characteristic of characterization of sure functions, the theorem here is not the optimal one. One could take a subset of D, one could be, could be a, a stronger theorem, but let's say that you have a function which is defined, no, no property whatsoever in D. It would be analytic and contractive in the open unit disk if and only if the operator of multiplication by S is a contraction from the RD space into itself. This is the RD space. So really here it means if you want that positivity, positivity, I mean, of this operator, really one MS, MS semester or this kernel, positivity implies analyticity. And I would refer to the work of uh, the, pay, the book of Donogu on this topic. And the De Brange-Rovniak space, I mean, there are ways to study, to introduce it, but basically it is this range, uh, range of this operator, the square root with the uh, operator norm. Uh, so now I would like to mention that uh, various extensions of the notion of sure functions have counterparts to various important generalizations of linear systems. For instance, sure other classes and related to ND systems and linear time varying systems and upper triangular contractions. And before I go into my lecture, I would like to discuss a bit the upper triangular contractions because it's a nice example and it gives motivation on how from classical de branch spaces one wants to go to, to more general ones. So the motivation here is also from linear systems. So you would like a system which is time varying. Time varying here meaning really that it is uh, in, not invariant under shift. And the idea is to replace the RD space by upper triangular Hilbert-Schmidt operators from L to Z into itself. So this is a Hilbert space. 
and ensure functions by upper triangular contractions. And uh, we have this very well known uh, connection between the Hilbert Schmidt norm and the operator norm. So it really means that if you have a contraction, the multiplication by S is a contraction from the Hilbert Schmidt operators, a part triangular here we take for um, the causality into themselves. And here too, you have the branch of the space defined by this range. And uh, I will not go into details because this is not the, the aim of the talk, but I wanted to, to mention here still that in a way classical to the, in a way similar to the classical case, the whole theory extends uh, where with a function theory where diagonals are replace complex numbers. And here in some sense, we have something similar where the, uh, the complex numbers are replaced by some algebra of a certain kind. Uh, if you want to study stochastic systems that will be stochastic distributions, but you can forget about the word stochastic distributions by an algebra of a certain type. So this is um, uh, uh, about this visualization. Another thing I would like to mention, which will be important in the SQL, is the state space equation, which we have in, in linear system theory, which originated uh, with Kalman. So in one of the previous slides, I discussed the input-output relation, un and yn, and here it goes via um, uh, a state xn. In this talk or in this slide, A, B, C, D could be matrices, but in advanced theories, uh, it, they, are, they are really uh, operators, possibly unbounded operators. As I said, there is a whole world and the purpose of a lecture here is not to, to, to um, survey it. So let's say there are matrices in, in this slide. And if you take the Z transform, and if you take X zero equals zero, you get this uh, formula for the function S. So here the function S would be rational and this would be called the realization of S, but it can hold in much more general setting I, as I just uh, mentioned. So if we want to, to summarize, uh, classical function theory plays a key role in inner systems and signal processing. Uh, the RD space also recently the Fox space for some uh, sampling theorems. And when the system has randomness in the parameters, one idea is to replace the complex numbers by some algebra. Now, uh, the, uh, that was the original motivation, but in my, in my next slide, I will give another motivation. So a first example of a strong algebra. So uh, let me give a motivating example. So we have uh, the Schwartz functions and the tempered distributions. So we know the Schwartz functions are uh, the same function, I speak here in one variable, the C infinity function which go to zero and their derivative faster than any, um, any polynomial. So for instance, exponent minus x squared belongs to S, but exponent minus absolute value of x doesn't belong to S. For us here, an equivalent definition is given in terms of Hermit series. So we have, if you want, eta zero, Eta one and so on, the normalized Hermit functions. I've not recalled in the slides the definition of the normalized Hermit functions, but uh, it's quite standard. And um, so if you look at the power series here, uh, not the power series, the Hermit series, S of X is sum of A N eta N. So um, it will be in the short space, if and only if the coefficients belong to this intersection here of all these weighted, uh, uh, L2 spaces. Now, um, here the, poly the weight is polynomial. And what we'll think what happens if the weight is uh, exponential. And this is really the, uh, the idea will go from polynomial to exponential. That will uh, lead us to the, what we have, the, the, uh, the algebras we, we have in mind. So what, uh, here I should mention, we have a Gelfand triple. Uh, we have really the duality via L2. So here, here are the, the, Schur, the Schwartz function, and here is really the space which will interest us, the temper distributions. So if we put exponential weights, if we put exponential weights, two to the NP, for instance, so these functions, they, they form, they are, they are a subset of a subspace of, a, of a Schwartz functions, and here we still have a, uh, get found triple, and this is the dual. I would like to focus two slides from now. I would like to focus on this G prime. 
This G prime will, will be uh, the first real algebra with an appropriate product. I, I would like to mention that GP, or more precisely, the set of search functions, not really GP. I would like to mention that this was considered in previous works, like, for instance, Eindhoven and Meyers in Journal of Mathematical Analysis and Application in 87, and more recently by uh, Ali Gorska or Zelian Zafraniek in a paper, if I recall, on coherent states in Journal of Mathematical Physics. An important notion which appears here is nuclearity. Uh, both S and the space G, both the uh, Schwartz function and the space G, which I defined here, I fresh and nuclear. This will play an important role in the sequel. What is nuclearity? Well, nuclearity uh, is the following. You see, you, we have in both cases a decreasing sequence of Hilbert spaces with increasing norms. And in the present setting, nuclearity just means that these injection maps from SP plus two or GP plus two uh, to SP or GP, so one is included in the other, but this injection map or inclusion map, if you want, are trace class in the classical operator sense that is compact and uh, since they are positive, the, the sum of their eigen, eigenvalues is uh, finite. Uh, before I go to the G prime and the strong algebra, I would like to make another footnote in some sense and get a geometric characterization of G. Uh, I think it's of inter it has its own interest and this is why um, I, I choose to give it. So we have Meller's formula uh, for all the, uh, so which connects the the Hermit functions. And then uh, you have that if, well, here I wrote GP, but I really mean this power series is in GP if and only if you have this integral, which is finite. Now, GP is a rapporting kernel Hilbert space, and it is always important to have a geometric characterization of a rapporting kernel Hilbert space of functions. So these are entire functions with these properties. And of course, G would be the intersection. Well, I said at the intersection, at the beginning that the fog space is not so far away and in fact here you have a, a, a you have a relation with a fog space uh, so we have a GP that allow me to backtrack a GP uh, we have here this uh, this is a repository kernel of GP I wrote it here G of Z omega without reference to P and using Miller's formula you can see that it is of this form where this is a, the reporting kernel the Fox space, of course, with this uh, coefficient, and R of Z is this entire function. Okay, so um, time goes, and maybe it is time to really give an example of a strong algebra. So that's what I will do now. So let me let me mention. So we have S prime and G prime. I remember. Re so these are in, endowed with an inductive topology. My uh, talk here will be very descriptive and we will not go too much into the topological properties. Some topological properties, I will go into them because they're very important, but not all of them, but the, uh, I will go over them. But here they're endowed with an inductive topology. Now, S prime versus G prime. So the tempered distribution versus this space, what is the difference? Well, both are uh, dual of fresh and nuclear, so this is not a difference. Both are closed under convolution of coefficients. If a n and b n belong to S prime or G prime, then the convolution, which we have already met in um, at the beginning of the lecture for the inner system, but the convolution still belongs to S prime or G prime. But S prime, the relation between the norm is completely different. Well, S prime and G prime are not metrizable. When I say the norm, I mean the various norms which appear here in uh, of the corresponding GP and SP. And we have the following, res there is a following result. Um, so I def these are the, not the norm in either space. So if you are in the space S prime, and if you take A in S minus P and B in S minus Q with P bigger or equal than Q plus two, and look at the convolution, you have this inequality where A is this uh, uh, final, this, this uh, uh, constant which is bounded because you suppose p bigger to, uh, q plus two and this is not good in some sense because here you have two p so you 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 are to be in the space p and q s p and s q and then you jump to the space s minus two p more precisely 
Now in G prime, something much better happens. You see that if you have A in G minus P and B in G minus Q, then the convolution belongs in G minus P. So you stay inside the space G minus P, you do, you do not go beyond. And you have what we call it VEG inequality. VEG in 96 is the setting of stochastic distributions, proves such inequalities for another example, which I will discuss toward the end of the talk. So, um, and we have this inequality. So this is much better because you stay inside, inside uh, G minus P and you can iterate. So you see that if you iterate this inequality, you get here, of course, I have not mentioned here, but A is in G minus P and B in G minus Q. Well, A is in G minus P, so in particular in G minus Q, then you have this bond here for the P norm in terms of the original norm for the Q norm and this coefficient. Well, it suggests you can look at power series, at, but we're in a non metrizable space. So does it help us? And uh, the answer is yes, because the spaces are not metrizable, but they behave very well with respect to sequences. And here I would like to mention, so the, the two results which are here in this block are not related to the, to, the topo, to the algebra structure, they are just topological algebra, which follow from the nuclearity, or in fact, a bit less. I took as source the, the books of Gelfond Shilov and Gelfond Vilenkin, but there are a lot of other sources also. So these spaces, as I said, are not metrizable, but a sequence converges in the inductive topology in either space. Huh? If and only if it converges in one of the S minus P in the, in the corresponding topology. So for sequences, it is like you are in a Hilbert space. This is very good. You are in a non metrizable space, but for sequences, locally, you are in a Hilbert space. And the subspace of S prime of the same thing, G prime is compact, if and only if, here the parenthesis at the wrong place, I should say, if and only if it is compact in one of the S minus P or G minus P. This is also very important because for instance, if you look at a continuous map or analytic, well, here continuous on say on zero one into one of these space, the image is already in one of the S minus P. So locally you are in a Hilbert space. Uh, and here I mentioned that where would we use the, this inequality? It would be to show that the convolution is jointly continuous in G prime, but I will not go on the uh, further, insist on this in this uh, lecture. So if we, if we recap, we have discussed two examples of decreasing sequences of Hilbert spaces with increasing, no increasing norms, which are fresh and nuclear and whose dual can be handled with a natural product. Here that was, we have spaces of sequences and um, uh, we have, a convolution, we have uh, the convolution. But for the second example, we have a nice inequality, which allows locally to work if you want, like in the Hilbert space. And uh, originally it was due, due to VEG in a different setting as I, as I mentioned. So if you want the algebra I'm going to define, are really defined in terms of these two conditions, inductive limit of Banach spaces and the series, a family of inequalities of the norm. So it's, we want to have kind of a generalization of a Banach algebra. Okay, so uh, before the definition, I need to, to mention, uh, to define countably norm space, and here too, I, I use gelfand shilov terminology. Um, so we take a countably norm, a countably norm space is a, uh, it will be a locally convex uh, vector space whose topology is defined with a countably set of compatible norms. I will not go here into the notion of compatible norm. It's the, the definition is on the slide, but it is a very important notion and it has to be uh, satisfied. And when you look at functions, uh, it's not always automatic, they are, counter, they are counter examples. And so um, when you, it will be complete when you have this intersection and the Banach space, the case which doesn't interest us here, we, do, we want to go beyond Banach spaces, but it will be a Banach space if, a, if the sequence is uh, stationary. And as I mentioned in one of the previous slides, the dual will not be metrizable, but if it is a Banach space, but under a certain hypothesis like nuclearity, it will have a very nice structure, in particular for behavior of the sequences. So if you want, as I, let me repeat, 
with the clarity, we will be located in a Hilbert space and with wage inequality as in a Banach algebra. And this leads us to a first definition of a, of a strong algebra. So we start with a dual of a complete, a complete countable mass space and dot with a product. And it would be a strong algebra if you have these inequalities. Here, I didn't de denote the product by any, any special symbol. But you see, you don't, they look like Banach, Banach algebra inequalities, but they are not, because also we are not in the Banach algebra. And secondly, the P here and the Q are not the same. There is a D which depends on, um, uh, on the integer so that P is bigger or equal than Q plus D. I should add that we'll see an example later where uh, P can be a positive integer, they, they need not be uh, indexed by, um, the inequalities can also hold for, uh, for real numbers rather than integers. We'll see an example when we discuss uh, um, Dirichlet series. So in any event, um, so more, uh, another example which kind of includes the exponential, uh, uh, the exponential weight. So the idea of the proof, as I mentioned, was is reorient the work of VEG. Now for this specific result, you can find a proof in this exercise book um, so the idea, you take a sequence alpha n, which is super, I think one calls this super multiplicative, and such that for some d in n, the, this sequence is, is uh, this series is uh, summable. And we define this uh, k minus p. So it could be, here is a 2p that would correspond to a 4p there in the, for the exponential weight, but, but still here, uh, so we define these. And uh, then, because of the uh, super multiplicativity here, and because of this condition, we see that if A belongs to K minus P and B K minus Q, then we have this inequality. So this gives a, a large range of examples. But the next example, uh, and it allows us this condition here, allows us to understand the definition in this setting between the tempered distributions and G prime. You see, for the tempered distribution, the weight is n plus one minus p. I may, it may have to be two p for the present computation. I apologize. If you go over my notes, it may have to be two p. I mean, it's correct with p, but maybe there are some factor which is missing. In any event, whether p or two p, this will not hold for the tempered distribution, but it will trivially hold for uh, these exponential weights and for other weights too. So. The reason, at least the reason we understand why the S prime do not have this uh, whole uh, series of inequalities is that uh, it's not super multiplicative, the, 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 these polynomials. Now, um, up to now, I redefined discussed Hilbert spaces, but if we want some more examples and also maybe some examples which pertain to analytic functions, let us see uh, the Wiener strong algebra associated to a strong algebra. So suppose we have a strong algebra, let's take Banach spaces or Hilbert space, doesn't matter. And when you take a n sequences, your two-sided sequences in BP, define this WP. This is a Banach space. It is a Banach space, but not a Banach algebra. Uh, if you take from zero to infinity, you would get analytic functions of a positive power series. But the idea is that this union is a strong algebra. Now I gave a proof in the next slide because to show that the proof is really the same as the proof of a, the proof that the Wiener algebra, classical one is really a Wiener algebra. Simply you replace, one replaces um, the classical inequality, but the new inequalities of Vej. So this is your, the, the, you see, you take an element in this, um, uh, a sum of the a n are in b p. The, I should this is a misprint. There should be a b m here, so you get this inequality, and then this inequality is uh, you use the veg inequality, and then so the proof is exactly the same as for linear algebra. Simply, rather than writing that a b less or equal than maybe a constant times the norm f a and the norm of b, you have to use these inequalities. And, and let me repeat that even if we start from a strong algebra, which is an inductive limit of Hilbert spaces, we can define a whole family of strong algebra, which are inductive limits of Banach spaces by iterating this procedure. 
So um, before, so let me go to another example. So in the previous examples, we had N0 and Z. And here I would like to take a local, replace Z by a locally compact group. Uh, why locally compact? Uh, there is a result of Ricard in 68, which says that um, if you have a, a locally compact group with this uh, uh, arm, left arm measure, then this will be closed under convolution if and only if G is compact. And then this is a Banach algebra. And we want to go beyond Banach spaces and Banach algebra. And this is why we will take it locally compact. Um, so you, we take this, we take a semi-group and we take this as a product. So if you want the analog of this product when we looked at sequences is this one-sided convolution and this is a two-sided convolution. So this, we, and we take an inductive limit of such dot spaces where the measures are absolutely continuous with respect to the R measure. There are two R measures, the left and the right. Here I'm sitting on the left, but the right also plays a role. And then under these conditions, which of course uh, are the counterpart of the conditions we had for sequences, we have a strong algebra and this kind of edge inequalities. In the next slide, I would like to give an example related to Dirichlet series. And admittedly, the formula I will give can or certainly have been proved directly without, uh, without, uh, uh, without rem a reminder about uh, Vesh inequalities, but we go, I would like to mention we got them this way, I should say. But uh, the Menin transform is in the background. I did not mention it here, but the Menin transform is in the background. And um, uh, there have a, so we take P, that would be the revalued measurable functions. Here we take real valued, but possibly it could be also complex valued, so that this is finite for some P. And uh, we take the convolution, so it's one sided. We have this is a semi, we take. The multiplicative, I should have mentioned that we take the multiplicative group zero infinity and this corresponding semi-group and this is the R measure. And then um, we have this inequality, which as I said admittedly can certainly be proved directly, but we, we got it from, from, this, uh, from this approach. And if we apply, uh, I mentioned you have this paper where you can have also quite a number of other examples uh, here, another misprint, this fee should be this fee. Uh, we have this inequality, uh, and this is the Tariman function, as we got as a special case. Uh, I will not go into that. And here, too, uh, possibly this inequality can, prove, can be proved directly. I, I do not know, but we, we got it via, via this, uh, this approach. Phi is called the torsion function. It's really the no number of positive integers less than n relatively, relatively prime with n. So up to now, we had these uh, strong algebras. We'll, uh, we have an example and um, uh, space of entire functions. I would like to make a completely uh, change of, di of direction for the second part of the lecture. But we, at the end of the lecture, we'll end up back with um, uh, analytic functions. So the Fox space in an infinite number of variables has this as a reproducing kernel, where here I use a multi-index notation. And we would like to associate, uh, that's really what was done by, by not by Ida, but by, by Kondratriev, uh, to associate to F infinity a Gelfand triple and a strong algebra. And the original motivation was from stochastic PDs and Ida's white noise space theory. Uh, white noise space theory is really a, a theory using topological vector spaces, I should say, and not so much probability as we will see. But I, I first need to discuss, uh, I'm sure, all of you know, but I would like to recall what is a positive definite kernel. The terminology is very bad because when you look, but this is the terminology I see in papers, in books for all years, so I don't want to change it. But a, a function KTS will be called positive definite if all these matrices are non-negative, Hermitian and non-negative. So of course, non-negative is not positive definite, but uh, as far as I'm aware, this is a terminology and um, I will not change it. Uh, let me give two important examples for a SQL. Uh, I will, in the next slide, I will explain why they are positive definite. So if we take S R equal the real and S to L2 of R, we need real valued function for the SQL. But for some of the things I'm discussing now, complex valued function will be just as well. Then these two kernels are positive definite. But as we will see, they have completely different properties. 
So why are their positives definite and why do they have completely different properties? Let me explain. Well, um, products and sums of positive definite kernels are positive definite. So this is positive, this kernel is positive definite and so this one and also this one. About the product of positive definite kernels, uh, I would like to mention uh, to, the, to the students in the audience that it, it, it uses uh, Schur's lemma, you know, the dream of every student that the product of matrices is the entry-wise product. Uh, it, when you use this product, you get that the product of the Schur product of two positive matrices is still positive, and this is what is used there. So these uh, two kernels are positive. Now, Bochner theorem says that if you have a function of uh, positive definite on the real line, continuous at the origin, so T and S are real numbers here, then it is a Fourier transform of a positive finite measure. And here we have such a uh, construction with a Gaussian. But the K to construct the white noise space of a Fox space in an, uh, or to see the connection with a Fox space in an infinite number of variables is an extension of Wartner's theorem to the infinite dimensional case. Because, and if you have to recall one thing from this lecture for, for teaching is a following, following example I'm giving now, it's a nice uh, exercise using the dominated convergence theorem. Wartner's theorem does not hold for infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. And as we will see, and these are real valued function, there is no measure, Borel measure on L2R such that, so this function is positive definite, but you cannot write it as a Fourier transform of a Borel measure on L2 of R. I will give a proof on the next slide. Uh, first of all, so that we have something to recall from the lecture, and it's a nice exercise when you teach uh, measure theory. So the idea is like this. You assume by contradiction that there is such a measure. You put S equals zero you get that it is a probability measure. You, here it will be uh, one and here it will be one. And then you take an orthonormal basis of L2 of R. By Perceval equality, that the sum of uh, UN U square is finite, this goes to zero. It should be one line, uh, this goes to zero. And so this is bounded by one and goes to one. And you apply the dominated convergence theorem, you see that this also every n, so this is x point minus one half, and the dominated convergence theorem says that it goes to one. So you get x point minus one half is one, which is not true. So there is no such uh, a Bortner theorem for Hilbert spaces, but there is one theorem which is called the bortner minos theorem for uh, uh, nuclear spaces. I will define it on the, in the strong, in the, uh, in the next slide, you might wonder why then this proof will not work. This is this will not be true anymore in the, this still be bounded by one, but this will not be true in the case of a, a dual of fresh and nuclear space. So um, the counterpart of Bonnet's theorem for a real, here real is important for real fresh and nuclear space is the following. So you have this, we saw that this function was positive definite uh, on the L2, but it's still positive definite when we go to S, to the Schwartz functions. And then the bortner minos theorem says, it's true for any real fresh space, but I mentioned it for S prime. I should put R really, if these are real, real valued functions, it's, uh, it is a Fourier transform on a much larger space on the temper distribution. So you have this. The proof you can, the proof is not very difficult. In fact, you can find a proof in a book of Barry Simon uh, you can find also a proof in a book on stochastic PDEs by Oxandal and Zhang and two other um, uh, co-authors. Which are, and um, it, it's very useful for people who, who are uh, familiar with probability. It really useful Kolmogorov theorem, and then you have to remove to 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 uh, make the support of the measures uh, smaller. So allow me to discuss some probability for a couple of slides that would not be too much. So uh, here we have an, an isometry. If so here, if you want, this gives really when you when you make the develop when you write um, instead of s epsilon s, and if you make the comparing power series, you get an isometry between 
The Schwartz function is used as a subspace over L2 and the white noise space. And it extends to an isometry. So really you would have this. And this would be a way to, uh, to construct the Brownian motion. Now, why? Because the Brownian motion is a stochastic process with this uh, covariance function. Now, why uh, would we go via all these uh, topological arguments to construct the Brownian motion? It was already construct constructed by Wiener with just pure function theory a long time ago. Well, that would, would be a topic of another talk where constructions of stochastic processes with these covariance functions would be given. That includes also the fractional Brownian motion. But you see, this hints already of other links also with the branch spaces of entire functions. You see, you, you look at the function R for which this is positive definite, then there is a measure, the sigma, a positive measure which is summable with respect to one over u squared plus one, so that this property holds. Now for the branch spaces, uh, the closed linear span with respect to L2 of sigma of these are the branch spaces of entire functions. I refer to the book of Dean McKean. And I would like to mention also that the, these kernels have a long history and have been studied by people like Schoenberg from Neumann and Krein, so very respected persons. And, um, so there are interesting links here, but I will not discuss them. Now, uh, this space has a lot of, it got a lot of bases, but there is such a basis. Um, here are the Hermit polynomials, here are the Hermit functions. The Q is the, is the isometry I mentioned before. This is not very important for the, at this stage of, of the lecture. What is important is that this is an orthonormal, uh, orthogonal, not orthonormal, excuse me, orthogonal basis. And you have this. So this reminds you of a Fox space, of course. And the weak product here for the last the, last, the sequel of a lecture, I use the, notion, the notation of a weak product, which is used in that in those papers. But it's easier just to, not to write the losange, but write uh, write just nothing. But in any event, it's really the convolution with respect to the index set L, or if you want uh, the Cauchy product. In any event. Uh, this product is a nice product for the power for the uh, for the stochastic uh, stochastic uh, for random variables. It's not stable. L two is not stable. So we're back to the same problem we had at the beginning of the lecture. We have a space. We, we have a product which which we would like to use, but it is not a law of composition. It's not stable. So what should we do? And that's that's there is this looks like. Um, uh, very, uh, we have a nice explanation to this, but that Kondratriev in, uh, introduced this in, um, it seems a beginning very strange, but this year you have uh, this inductive limit, in fact. So these are, it looks like a formal power series, but when, in one moment we'll see they're not so much formal. We have an inductive limit, and uh, I will not discuss here the stochastic distributions, but we have, if you want, a Gelfand triple, but what I want to say is that we have a quantitative space and it's stable under the weak product. And so this is really the beginning where I, uh, when I worked on this, I, I um, go, got by chance under some paper where there's wage inequalities. And see, these are the one I discussed at the beginning. So what I, what I wanted to, to, ex, to uh, explain are a family of algebras and I here do not mention all the details, but a family of algebras where you have inequalities of this kind. And just to remind you, the importance of these, um, the importance of these algebras is that they look, they locally they are like, when, here, when you have nuclearity, locally it's like you are in a Banach space or Hilbert space, better. And they look like Banach algebras, but they are not Banach algebras but they kind of generalize Banach algebras thanks to these kind of inequalities. So uh, now let's go back to, to, to functions. There is the Hermit transform. So there was this H alpha. If there was, a, I had a tech problem. I wrote here BF. Now of, in irregular tech, I get a bold face Z, a BZ, but here uh, I couldn't get a bold face Z with a slide that can be a kind of a bug, so I write it U. So we associate to H alpha, these Z1 alpha, one, Z2 alpha, two, and so on. 
This is the Amit transform. And, it go, and then we go back from this white noise space to the Fox space in an infinite number of variables. So we're back to the beginning of a, of a, of a lecture in some sense. And then we can see what, how to do linear mm -hmm. systems in this, um, in this setting that will be really the, 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 more or less the end of my lecture. So I would like to mention that the same thing if you want that when you have a product of analytic function, it corresponds to the convolution of a power of a coefficient here. We have the same thing. The white noise space corresponds to the Fox space with a pointwise product. In this part of the lecture, we are focused more of, on randomness. It include it in it um, induces randomness in the in the process. And then we can say, okay, now we have linear stochastic systems. We take the same formulas that we had before, but rather than taking complex numbers, we take it in this contact ref algebra. And, uh, and then we have, if you want, two, uh, two, two, two set of variables. The set of variables Z, the variable Z, which is the classical one, which corresponds to classical function theory the, if, uh, from the Z transform. And these, Z, these uh, U alpha, Z1 alpha, Z alpha, and so on, which correspond to the random part. And so you have a hierarchy of transfer functions, and you can study a function theory and the kernels and so on in this, in this setting. There is a lot of, uh, a lot of work uh, to be done there. And if you, and in fact, we get, um, when you have a multiplication, see if there is a convolution on the level of, um, of, a, fox, of a fox space, and, it, and there is a convolution on the level of, it, of the time, that is really the time, you get uh, systems with double convolutions. One, which is with respect to the index in L. L are the sequences, alpha one, and so on, which are uh, where all the indices are zero, but a finite number of them, at most. And so the first convolution relates to the stochastic aspect, and the other to the time variable. And there would be much more to say, but uh, I, I will stop here. And the conclusion, if you want, is that motivated by stochastic analysis, uh, we introduced a family of topological algebras, which generalize the natural way Banach algebras. I didn't insist here in this lecture on properties, general properties of these algebras like on the spectrum and so on, I would refer to you to, 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 the, to the papers I have in particular with Guy Salomon. But I wanted rather to give a number of examples in this lecture and, and show various things between various topics. The applications uh, which I presented are to stochastic processes, but there are also applications in the Grassmann algebra. Uh, as I mentioned, the paper I had with Ismail, Ismail Paiva and some hypercomplex settings. And the hope is that these algebras will also play a role in complex analysis. And uh, for instance, um, there are links with kernels, positive definite kernels, I mean with values which are continuous operators from one such algebra into its anti-dual. And if you want, um, if you, positivity can be defined not only for operators in Hilbert space, if you recall, but for operators from a topological vector space into its anti-dual. I speak, I speak of anti-dual because of the complex numbers that if you take real spaces, the dual is enough. And positivity means this, you see, if A is from A to A star, AF is a, is a anti-linear functional and A, A applied to F gives give a complex number, you want it to be positive. And then too, you can def define rational functions, analytic functions. So there is a, there is a whole um, world of problems to be solved. But I will stop here and uh, well, thank you for it, for your for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, now, um, are there any questions? If you have a question, then please just, um, I, I won't be able to see your raised hands. Yeah, I, I will give, I can give the slides. I mean, I saw a number of, I was asked for, if I can give a slide. 
I saw a number of misprints. I will correct them, and then I will, I will forward you the slides. Absolutely. Thank you. So I don't see any, uh, well, it seems like there aren't any questions. So let's thank our speaker once again. Thank you. And we uh, will continue in 10 minutes.